So welcome everyone um, to this next session. Nice to see such a packed audience. Um, and this session is called Between the Lines, Crime Reduction and Young People. And um, there's just been a main stage um, uh, discussion on this and county lines. So I think that is very good to see. My name is Anne Longfield. Um, I've worked with children's and families organizations for a long time now. Uh, but was also the Children's Commissioner until earlier this year. I'm really delighted to be chairing this event and a quick intro from this end onwards. Do you want to just say hello? I'm on. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Donna Jones and I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. I was elected in May this year. Um, I've spent 16 years as a member of the judiciary, so I spent a lot of time working with criminal justice partners and some of the more troubled people in our communities that cause a lot of issues. I was also the leader of uh, City Council from 2014 to 2018, so I've also been in charge of the you know, strategy, policy and budgets for youth offending teams. Um, as well as being the Commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, I'm also the national lead for serious organised crime and also for victims, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Good choice. You'll know, cover lots of bases there. Samuel. Hi, afternoon everyone. Samuel Kasumu. Uh, up until the end of May, I was a special advisor to the Prime Minister where I had the Civil Society and Communities Brief, uh, which did have some, some work around uh, crime reduction for young people and some of the work that NYA have been up to was also part of my portfolio. Um, in terms of my background, um, I've been in and around youth work for a long time. In fact, my first job was with the National Youth Agency where I was delivering some uh, <laughs> hair by right training as part of the Integrated Youth Support Services. And I'm currently a counsellor in Hatfield Villages. Brilliant. Another perfect addition here. Abby. Hi, everybody. My name is Abby McClatchy. I'm the director of youth work at the National Youth Agency. We're the professional body for youth work in England. Um, I've been a youth and community worker for nearly 24 years, working with vulnerable young people in a variety of environments, including the secure estate and um, young people that are looked after. And we're going to be joined, we hope, by Kit Mal Malthouse, who is the um, Minister of State for Crime and Policing, Home Office, and the Minister of Justice too. Um, so it's it's about six years since I first started getting asked, what is this county lines thing? Um, you know, we've heard about this. Well, how does it work? You know, how um, extended is this um, uh, activity? And actually, the person who started asking mostly about that was the then ITV uh, political correspondent on the main news, who was Allegra Stratton, who you remember. Um, and she really got into this idea and really wanted to pursue it. And I think what we've seen over the last six years is that this now has become something which has kind of come out of um, the fringes, sadly, and is now part of the dialogue of so many people. Everyone I've asked from, you know, my 88-year-old mother-in-law who's, you know, not known for being kind of up on some of these things. Um, people who are living in rural areas, urban areas, and they've heard of this. It's now become uh, very much part of a mainstream concern. And the other thing that's happened is that it's moved from something which is, you know, particularly about urban areas, people only four or five years ago used to say, look, this is something that's happening in Lewisham, this is something that's happening in a bit of Merseyside here or, or Birmingham, into something which actually is part of every police force in the country. Um, so it's something which has taken hold and we know that the individuals, the criminals who are driving this are using children as a commodity of choice, essentially, to make money. And we also know that during the pandemic, um, more children have become vulnerable and that um, those that are seeking to exploit them have increasingly sophisticated models, increasingly brutal, but have this relentless desire to make money and exploit. Hello there, welcome. Oh, sorry, Hi. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was standing outside the YC thinking that was the youth zone. Oh, you know. well, you're here. No, we've just, we've only just started. Um, uh, so we've we've had some acknowledgement of that. We've had the Prime Minister, um, you know, quite openly saying he wants to bring an end to county lines, bite the heads off. 
uh, county lines, and that's the right thing, I think, to say and do. We've got the NCA County Line Centre, we've got violence reduction units, and um, I think we probably all think they're a very good thing. Um, and we have the crime plan, um, which I think we're probably hearing a little bit more about. But also we've got, you know, modern slavery legislation, which is giving the police increasing kind of tools and ammunition to be able to fight um, this. But we do know the relentless. We know that those that are doing this have, you know, a, an endless ambition and greed for more money. And we know they're agile. You know, they see something in front of them. They don't stop. They just go around the edges. Kids can't, you know, during lockdown, kids can't get on trains anymore and travel. Oh, well, you know, we'll dress them up in Sainsbury's outfits and others in Sainsbury's, you know. It, the, the amount of business kind of creativity that goes into this backed up by that relentless brutality is something that I think um, we, um, you know, always uh, is a shocking surprise, if you like. Um, so the purpose of this next kind of 40 minutes or so discussion is to, I think, slightly to take stock, but look at what we do about this. Where do we go um, from here? And the minister's now joined us. Kit, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, sorry, I was saying. A few late. comments. Is that all right? Shall I, yeah, shall I, shall I I'll, let you settle I'll first? I'll be quick. What I thought I'd do is, is talk to you a little bit about where we are in, in the evolution of dealing uh, with these issues. Because as you rightly say, uh, we've got a sort of twin track, track approach uh, on young people involved in crime. Uh, first of all, as you outlined, we've got uh, a heavy program of enforcement. We do believe that police enforcement can make a difference, not least in creating space for other more therapeutic, uh, possibly, and support mechanisms to come alongside. So the work we're doing on county lines, we had a session hall this morning, is now uh, working really well. Uh, we've got a new MO with the big exporting forces, Liverpool, West Midlands and London, now working with provincial forces to take these lines out. Uh, something like 6,800 arrests so far, over 1,000 lines closed, and importantly, over 1,900 people, disproportionately young people, safeguarded and steered away from that kind of exploitation. And you are right that the, the legislation is now giving us some new tools that we can use uh, to protect them as part of that enforcement mechanism. We have, for example, found in Liverpool, uh, where Merseyside police have used uh, grooming um, legislation to prosecute those who've been exploiting young people, uh, that that has a double effect. First of all, it gives them a, a proper punishment. But secondly, if you are convicted of grooming, you end up on the wrong sort of wing in the prison system. Um, and it is a big deterrent to, to drug dealers and those who would exploit young people to think that either through grooming or through modern slavery that they'll end up even they do not want to associate with the other people who are on the wing, uh, uh, who've been convicted of that kind of crime. So there's lots of work that is being done in that area. And we will uh, enhance that. Obviously, the 20,000 uplift gives us more capacity to do that. Uh, the force is now working together, particularly on county lines, uh, to get that done. Alongside that, we've rolled out a program recently called GRIP funding, which is essentially uh, restoring the notion of hotspot policing. We know that violence, particularly youth violence, is very geographically uh, sticky. It's in a small number of areas, very identifiable. We know where they are. We can analyze them right down to 200 yards of a street uh, where disproportionately violence occurs. And we can make sure that the police are there on a frequent enough basis that they deter the crime. And we've seen in places like South End and in parts of Bedfordshire, big falls in violence where this approach is, is adopted, 70 odd percent in South End. Um, I put 17 million pounds now against that program. You'll see it rolled out alongside that. So enforcement is one side. But the other side, which is really the long-term solution, uh, is exactly what I hope we're here to talk about today, which is about the prevention work. What can we do effectively to target hardened young people who show signs early on that they're likely to get involved in crime, and they are identifiable quite, at quite a young age, uh, to get ahead of that and, and move them on? Our main delivery mechanism, as you said, is the, is the network of 18 violence reduction units. We're now in year three of those VRUs, and you know, when I look at the evolution of them, it's quite remarkable how much more scientific and professional they've become over the three years. The first year before my time, we put money out there. It was spread out in the areas, came back a bit hit and miss in terms of results. Second year was all about sharp identification of individuals. Um, who should we be dealing with? We're, this is a bit hit and miss. 
can we focus? Is there a list that we can compile with our partners of the young people we're concerned about? And then this year has very much been about the professionalization of that intervention with them, uh, making sure that we are, in many cases, quasi-medically treating these people who have a lot of you know, emotional scar tissue and other mental problems that mean they're likely to get into to crime. At the moment, uh, we are very much dealing with the, the kind of 12 to 18 year old, um, that kind of cohort. But my ambition, and what I've said to violence reduction units, the long term ambition is that in six, seven, eight years' time, that we're not actually talking about teenagers. We're talking about children that are two, three, four. Um, and that that is where we do the most of our work. In, the point being that if we put them right then, they won't be the teenagers of the future that get into trouble. And there's lots that we can do at that stage. But one of the key areas that I'm stressing, and I'll just finish on this before I hand over. One of the key areas that I'm stressing uh, that's, that's very important to me is when you, when you look at young people who get involved in crime, pretty much 100% of the time when you examine their story, they have developed a, a problem with attachment at an early age. I don't know if you know, aware of this thing, attachment theory, a, theory, a psychological theory that was devised back in the 1950s uh, by a couple called Bowlby, where they said that if, it, if in the early stages of your life you fail to form strong attachments with adults, um, responsible adults in your life, then it leads to all sorts of emotional uh, problems in the future and a disconnection from society. And again and again, when I look at the reports, particularly uh, the, the reports that are done into the uh, youth murders and homicides, I see this problem with attachment. And from my point of view, one of the things I'd love to see and uh, maybe I'll talk to the Department of Health about this, we, we talk a lot, don't we? We teach parents about things like not, don't smoke in the car, don't smoke when you're pregnant, lots of things you could do about oral health for your children. You know, there's lots of things that we teach them, but we don't teach attachment theory as a public health issue. We don't say that attachments are important. And if you want to see a prime example of this, go on the internet and Google Ian Wright teacher, and you will find some very moving videos of Ian Wright meeting the teacher who took him under his wing when he was a seven-year-old boy, going off the, off the rails and turned him into the magnificent adult man that he came to be, right? And when he sees this teacher, when they're reunited, he says through tears in his eyes that it made him feel like a seven-year-old boy again. And this is the power of attachment. And I think if we can do more of that work in the years to come, then we stand a chance of winning. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you um, for that kit. And that really links with the work that Andrea Leighton's doing yeah. with First Thousand One Days and, um, you know, the work at the school gate and the work with the, the youngest. Um, we'll come back for more discussion on that. But um, Donna, um, you know, prevention, your police and crime commissioner in Hampshire, um, you know, Hampshire's lovely, but there's also, you know, there's also areas where life's tougher. You know, where, 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 where do you think the priority needs to be for this? Thank you very much. Um, well, before I get started, how many of you were at the county line session this morning? A couple. Okay, well, in which case, you're going to have to indulge me, sorry, because I'm going to repeat something I said earlier. Um, you know, Kit's touched on, the minister's touched on a really, really good point, and both he and I were obviously on that session together this morning. And for me, it's about... First of all, making sure the public, it's two, two points to, to the question in my answer. The first one is about the support that I do as a commissioner in terms of the services that I commission. The other point is around making the public aware of exactly what the harm is of their, <coughs> of having a joint at the weekend or taking some casual cocaine. Because actually, the exploitation of young people, 15, 16 year olds that are running these county lines that are being exploited is off the scale. And actually, the link between the casual uh, joint smoker or cocaine taker at the weekend and counter-terrorism, I'm going to explain to you the link between, between that uh, and terrorism. So first of all, um, as we know, 11, 12, 13 year olds start smoking joints in the park and then they develop a uh, marijuana addiction that might be 20, 30 pounds a day. And then they need to start selling drugs to pay for their own addiction. And then they get scooped up by the local 25, 26 year old person that they aspire to be because perhaps there is no uh, role model, no one providing aspiration to them in their lives. Uh, they feel a bit disconnected from society. Perhaps they're being excluded from school. They don't have great relationships with their family. Perhaps they're in care. And here the criminality starts. And then we start criminalizing young people and then their outcomes drop significantly. 
So once they've then got their drug addiction and they've been scooped up by the friendly 25, 26 year old local drug dealer, they're then in that chain of command. And the chain of command of exploitation, of course, doesn't just start and stop with the 25 year old person that lives in the town or city that's supplying them with the drugs that they're selling onto their mates each week. So where are the drugs coming from? Well, they're obviously coming mostly from abroad. There is obviously UK homegrown class B drugs in terms of marijuana. But with the class A drug, this is where we then get to the terrorism. And this is, you know, 82% of the heroin uh, consumption in this country comes from Afghanistan. Now, with Afghanistan now being a destabilized country, with the Taliban back in control, the concern, and I obviously in my role as serious organized crime lead for commissioners, I'm working with the National Crime Agency and also clearly with the Home Office through the Minister's team. But actually, the link up there, it really is very serious indeed. And these young people, they are being scooped up by these, by these drug dealers, by these county line gangs. And when they go off to do their first drug deal, their first drug drop, maybe a couple of grams worth of cocaine or heroin, uh, they get robbed as soon as they get off the train, and then they owe their dealer a debt. And that's where then the sexual exploitation will often come in if they have a younger sibling. And the drug dealer will be saying, well, you can either do another four runs for me free of charge to pay off your debt, or get me some indecent images of your you know, five-year-old sister in the bath. And this is how you have violence, sex, sexual exploitation, terrorism. You, you know, the, it's, it's a whole cacophony of stuff that's going on. And actually, the solution on how we're tackling this is complex. Final comment from me, because I know we want to get through as many questions as possible. Through my office, all of the commissioners, supported brilliantly by the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice, we are paying for commission services. So yes, I am commissioning ca charities out there who are very experienced with scooping up these young people. They, they, we call them FTEs, first time entrants into the criminal justice system, and those we know that are extremely vulnerable of becoming first time entrants that we need to help. I'm trying to recruit business leaders across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight in my patch to become mentors for these young people. Summer holidays, Easter holidays, half term, go and hang out at the local BMW dealership and help clean some cars or go and hang out at Sainsbury's and you know they might not pay you but you're going to have somebody there who's going to be looking out for you and going to be someone in your life you can pick up the phone to. This is so important and also like Kit has said, the minister has said, for me it's about winding it right back to when they're small children, even prenatal, to make sure that those troubled mums and dads, often very young parents themselves, don't pass on the troubles they've had in their childhood onto their own children. Great, thank you so much. Um, Samuel, you've been given advice. Um, <laughs> um, what was your, you know, what, 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 what do you think is the absolute priority here? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it, it, uh, for those of you who haven't read the, the government's uh, beating fine plan, the Prime Minister, my, my old boss's opening words were, if we are to succeed in leveling up this country, we must give everyone the security and confidence that comes from having a safe street and a safe home. But what does this look like for young people that are vulnerable to crime, exploitation, as we heard just now, and the criminal justice system? Uh, and of course, whilst we await the, the white paper on leveling up and everyone continues to debate the meaning, I'm sure you've all been to fringes where you've heard different interpretations of leveling up. Um, in this particular context, we must be unambiguous that leveling up means improving outcomes in specific geographical areas. As the crime plan states, uh, homicides, serious violence, and neighborhood crime are concentrated in certain neighborhoods, with nearly a quarter of neighborhood crime concentrated in just 5% of local areas. We also know that many of these crimes are committed by a small number of persistent criminals with just 5% of offenders, accounting for 50% of all crimes, which is a, a, a statistic that for me is very, very striking. Uh, drugs often play a prominent role, as we've just heard, and in the year to March 2020, 48% of homicides were drug-related. So leveling up in this context means tackling violent crime uh, in specific areas geographically, uh, more often than not urban se settings, being bold on drug policy, and doing more to rehabilitate repeat offenders. Anything else, to me, is merely a plaster on a gaping wound. Uh, very briefly, I want to touch on two, two of those, those areas. On tackling youth crime, I thought Sean Bailey's uh, manifesto had some really fascinating and interesting ideas um, around how we can really level up those areas where we, where we are experiencing significant crime levels. Its core focus was on spending significantly in youth provision, ensuring every young person had access 
to pos a positive role model and ensuring police bi policing by consent is effective uh, and in tandem with communities. Uh, I agree with the minister that enforcement alone is not enough to make the progress that we wish to see, um, though it plays an important role, of course. The truth is, when I was in government, even as somebody whose first job was in uh, youth services and someone that's completely passionate about improving youth outcomes, I, I myself found, found myself in positions where there were often competing pressures. Uh, and now I'm a local councillor. Uh, I'm acutely aware of the strain on local government finances. Uh, but in my opinion, we've had a pandemic that actually means that we have to invest more. And the, and the idea of investing in the next generation uh, is more important than, than ever to me. Um, and, and, I, and I often try to, remi well, I did remind when I was still in government, my colleagues that we won an election on a promise to invest at least 500 million pounds through the Youth Investment Fund. Um, and it is vital that we, 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 we honor that commitment. Um, but we've got to be creative. In Sean's uh, manifesto for London, he found that there were over 400 million pounds in dormant assets uh, through Oyster cards that uh, uh, have been unspent. Um, and he was proposing that that money was invested in, in youth services. If I was still at number 10, part of my work would be focused on the dormant assets classes that uh, we're currently amending uh, through primary legislation in the, in the House of Commons to unlock that money that is vital for youth services. Very pleased about the work that Kit is doing around investing uh, a package in uh, young people who are in A&E with a knife injury. I think we're investing about 17 million pounds in that, which is good. Um, and very quickly, if I may, on, on the idea of rehabilit rehabilitating offenders, I think we have fantastic examples of this work through violence reduction units, though some of the uh, uh, levels of success vary by, by region. Um, but I think the sharing of best practice in this area is, is pivotal. And, and, and as a conservative that is very passionate about crime reduction, um, I think that we do have a big issue around narrative when it comes to how we engage with those who are offenders. Um, if all we ever do is tell the public that offenders are simply the bad guys and not the truth, which is that very often offenders have been failed by either their communities or a number of agencies, and also very often that they are... And, and parents, yes. Um, and, and very often, offenders are themselves vulnerable individuals. If we're not very honest about that fact, then why would members of the public decide to give offenders a second chance? Um, the, the one thing that, that we're, the government is doing that I think is uh, excellent is we have committed to uh, uh, employing a 1,000 ex-offenders by the end of 2023. So in civil service, for me, is one of the most in inclusive employers in the world and, and very often leads the way in showing how you can be inclusive as an employer. But we need to do more. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll end there. And, and just, just to summarize, in my opinion, leveling up for cr crime means three things to me. One, um, crime reduction in specific areas. Two, uh, being bold about drugs policy. And, and three, uh, ensuring that um, uh, we continue to uh, invest in rehabilitating offenders. Brilliant. Thank you. And Abby, <laughs> last but not least here, you're, I mean, you're talking about the people who, you know, are going to go out there, youth workers, to find those young people to inspire them rather than exploit them. So yeah. your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, I think the first point that I'd really like to make is that we really need to remember that young people should be considered as young people first. So young people are victims of and vulnerable to crime and exploitation by adults. And that's the key. You know, we need to protect children and young people. When we criminalise children and young people by not providing the support that they require in early intervention, we waste talent and we don't support some young people that have valuable skills and, and create the opportunities for them. Earlier this year, we published our Between the Lines report, and that highlighted the ongoing and increasing risk to young people from organised crime gangs from criminal exploitation. It doesn't just happen in cities, though. We talk about county lines, but also we see an increasing tendency to, um, to exploit young people through in-county grooming as well as cross-county grooming. It's not just about moving young people around the country. 
According to the Home Office, 27,000 young people are involved in county lines. Only 4,000 of those young people are in London. 4,000 is a significant number, but it doesn't account for all of those other young people that are being exploited and harmed every day by this practice. Digital media and social medias are also increasingly being used in diverse ways to groom young people. And so one of the questions that I pose is how well are services, youth services and young people that work with young people, such as teachers, really equipped to support young people to understand the risks and harms that are posed by those routes. Um, what we know is that there's a lack of sufficient youth services and support for young people, particularly in county towns and particularly in rural areas. Um, there's a concentration of really excellent diversionary projects that support young people, but these are often to be found in urban areas and cities, and this is a problem for all of our young people. Um, Another point that I think it's really important to consider when we talk about this topic is the exploitation of young women within county lines and organised crime gangs. Um, if you haven't watched it yet, I really recommend you watch the Hidden Lives documentary that's on the BBC iPlayer at the moment um, with Kendra Houseman, who's one of the ambassadors for the Commission of Young Lives, who talks about the exploitation of young women by organised crime gangs and how they are coerced um, and exploited through these mechanisms. So what do we need to do in order to support and address this? Um, we need a, a cross-departmental government strategy that focuses on criminal exploitation with a youth work approach embedded in it. We need diversionary, um, diversionary projects within schools that really look to reduce exclusions, but more importantly, to focus on the language of inclusion. How do we make environments that bring young people in and keep them in by using really positive relational approaches that give them the opportunity to build attachments such as the one that, um, that the minister spoke about for Ian Wright, with positive role models that can build those relationships that are youth workers. We need investment in youth work across the country in order to level up, to give all young people the parity of opportunity to be supported to address this issue, particularly in areas where those services might be lacking for young people due to a lack of um, a lack of systemic youth work approaches. And I think the key for me in this is that it's about collaboration. We need youth services and justice and education and health to all come together to uh, implement a public health approach to recognise how we can support young people and families in order to support communities to eradicate this moving forward. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we're going to have a bit of time for discussion now and um, I'm going to ask for questions, comments and while you're um, you know, getting together, I'm just going to ask um, Kit, if I may, just a couple of questions because your point about attachment is really refreshing to hear and I'm one of those people that have banged on about attachment for 100 years or so and um, you know, clearly that's not all your, government, all your department's bag. So I wondered whether how near you felt we were for, to persuade all of the rest of the government departments in there, because it's health and it's education and early years and keeping them in school, that this was the, one of the big things that actually would make a big difference. Yeah, so the Prime Minister's made it very clear to everybody, and I've been in meetings where he has, that he regards every department as a crime-fighting department. Um, and that's from the DFE right through the DHSC, through every department, basically DWP. Um, and so the question is, uh, from, from our point of view, is going into a comprehensive spending round for the next three years, what does that look like? Now, I can't uh, obviously front-run what the Chancellor's going to decide, but you can rest assured that pictures have gone in um, effectively based on that premise that there is a role for all those departments to play whether it's in schools or out there in the streets or whatever it might be um, interestingly the, the other one that has a part to play of course is the Department for Culture, Media and Sport uh, who hold quite a big uh, part or may do after the spending review of youth funding um, and we've been in conversation over the last year or so uh, with them about what part they can play I have to say, in terms of attachment, I'm particularly focused, and I'm, my, my eye is caught by your sponsor thing there, that was the scouts. Uh, particularly, yeah, exactly, and squirrels and all the rest of them. Uh, guides, hopefully, out girl guides are there, um, but Prince's Trust. 
There are a variety of youth-based organizations who have become expert over many, many decades, sometimes centuries, in creating those kind of attachments. Scouts, guides, cadets, you know, all those kind of things where you know, they are, if you look at the geographic spread, they are not in the areas necessarily where we need them the most. Um, and whether there's something we could do to encourage them to spread their work to other parts of the, of the country would be great. And in fact, when we were at City Hall, uh, Boris and I, one of the things we did do as part of our push on youth crime there was look at those uniform youth groups across London and whether we could push them into those areas. Because, as I say, that is what they are for. That is what they do. Yeah. They teach attachment. They, they give you those role models and those relationships that will help you into the, the future. So I'm hopeful that you'll see something coming out of the spending review. The other key one just to mention that I'm very focused on is, is as was raised, is attendance at school. Uh, because obviously that is a place where important attachments are formed in a young person's life. And we see too often, particularly young men who get involved in crime, that there is a, a drop-off between primary school and secondary school where they're bright, smart young kids at primary school doing really well, but something goes wrong at the transition period. They stop attending, and suddenly they, the next thing you know, you find them three hours away in a cuckoo uh, home uh, dealing drugs, right? So these are some of the issues that we're very focused on. Hopefully you'll see more in the SR. Brilliant. And I think, you know, the new Secretary of State in Education will, I think, understand some of those things. But I know a lot of people will uh, really back that in terms of keeping uh, kids in school. And I'm also pleased if there's any scouts representatives here of the organization. A conversation last, conversation last week with uh, the CEO was about putting squirrels into some of the areas of highest violence, and I thought that that would be a great thing, and it's very positive about that. Okay, so uh, gentleman at the back here, and then this lady here, and this gentleman here. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think you've missed a point here. What all you're saying is absolutely excellent. Uh, about 25 years ago, I got involved in the Drugs and Alcohol Recovery Charity, which we started. We now deal with 350 people constantly, all the time, which is peanuts. This is in the north. This is in Burnley, a very poor area. I find the Telegraph so depressing because it can't say a decent thing about anything, particularly the government. But it did have a very interesting article the other day, and it was about the co-op shops, followed by about eight of the other big retailers, who instead of prosecuting people who are stealing to take drugs, they're going to put that money they've lost into giving those children therapy. Now, these children you're talking about, the one person, except for when I shouted out very rudely, uh, the one person you never mentioned was their parents. Children go to school and get into real difficulty because their parents can't read. So when they're expected to go home and do some prep, their parents can't read and don't know what they're doing. Why don't we help those parents more? Those children you're talking about, their parents are totally dysfunctional. In our recovery, I'll give you a, 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 a very quickly another source of people who could help you. The people in our charity who recover, and we're talking about thousands of people over 20 odd years, because this is 300 people on a six week thing. Their main recovery is understanding what problem they've gone through and recovered from. And what makes them recover is actually volunteering to help other people who haven't yet found that illness. So that's what you've got to do. Use the people when they recover to help other people. No, thank you. thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm thank late you. for my next thing, so I'm not being rude. All right, but I think the, the, the point about parents is something that, you know, given more time, I think we've all gone into, but certainly the whole issue of attachment, you know, it's absolutely parents at the heart. Yeah. This, um, it was this lady in front, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Hiya, uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Queenie, I'm from Croydon, London. My question to you and probably everyone in this room is how do we tackle the hype or the sort of get rich quick mentality, also given the fact that not all young people 
um, have necessarily grown up in a dysfunctional household? Um, and also, how do we then show young people the value in transferable skills when it comes to progression, given also the fact that because we're in this digital age and you know the music industry just kind of glamorizes um, what life really should look like? So I just wanted to get yeah. your thoughts okay, on that. Okay, thank you. This gentleman here. Hello, uh, Jason from Sky News. Um, just wanted to ask what you thought about, you know, accusations that conservatives have cut 660 million in youth services and whether that's something you regret. Um, what's happened to the Serious Crime Reduction Task Force? Is that still meeting or has it been disbanded? And a slightly less journalistic question. I'm really interested in the, the grey area between someone who's considered needing, needing of safeguarding and someone who's arrested. And where, do you, where do you draw that line? You know, because sometimes you do get people who are safeguarded and then they return to county lines and start again. I've come across examples of this. I'm just really interested to know what you think. Where do you find, draw that boundary? Is it age or, or something else? Okay. Brilliant. Um, Donna, you wanted to come in first of all in terms of... I'm really conscious of time session. and I would love yeah, yeah. to hear more from you. So I'm just going to cover the Telegraph piece if I yeah. can. Because actually that was a story that I gave to the Telegraph. It was written by a journalist called Charles Hymus. He's their home affairs correspondent. Um, and actually he wrote a very balanced article. The Daily Mail also wrote the same story because I met with both him and Rebecca Campbell from the Daily Mail. She totally stitched me up and said, Crime Chief says that we shouldn't send um, shoplifters to prison. It's not actually what I said at all. There you go. But the Telegraph wrote a balanced piece look it up if, if you if you're so inclined and the whole point of what the the co-op have done it actually wasn't with children it's with adults and there's a brilliant police officer who is supporting national retail crime called Stuart Toogood and he is the person that introduced me to this program and the co-op were constantly phoning the police because they were having um, you know prolific shoplifters you know we're talking about people who've been on heroin for five six ten years going in in the morning getting their goods the coffee the beef the whatever the meat the, the alcohol going off selling it, getting their hit, coming back in the evening to shoplift, to go and sell, sell it again, to get their next hit for the night. Um, and it was just a perpetual cycle. And of course, by the time the police arrived, the person's gone, sorry. Uh, and so, you know, they thought there has to be a better way. And all credit to the co-op, because they actually took some of these people, they took 10 people they identified by working with, it was actually West Midlands Police, and they put them through residential, which are very expensive, residential drug rehab programs. And I met one of the girls online who'd been a 10-year heroin addict. She was only 28. She said, I think I would have been dead by now if I'd not had their support. And she's now clean for, I think, a year, and she is working for the co-op. So it's an absolutely brilliant program. But the point that that gentleman made about working with families, yes, with the parents, of course, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, Samuel, briefly, if you could, what about the glamour stuff? How do we counteract the hype and the quick, fast... Yeah. kind of success uh, yeah two, two points um on, on that i think uh, the, what is really important is back to sean bailey's manifesto direct investment in new services making sure everyone has a, access to a role model um, it, these things sound so simple but they're they're the things that are the difference between somebody being able to be a success of their life and going down the wrong wrong route and actually exposure to people who are who are living successful normal lives um, and, and I think sometimes the challenge is we glamour, well, not we, not me, but a lot of people glamorise the wrong things. And actually being able to feed your family is the type of thing that I think should be uh, glamorised. Being able to be structured in your day and, and, and going to work, uh, you know, nine to five is something that I think should be respected and applauded. Can I just very quickly touch on the, the, the cross-governmental elements of things that have been, that've come up? The reality is the way the government works is most departments are very territorial. And so if you want to have a cross-governmental response to something, it needs to be led by the center. And when I say the center, that is either the cabinet office or number 10. And, and actually, the one thing I think everybody should really be looking out for is this new prime minister's delivery unit. The hope is that it will be able to you know, cajole departments to, do, to play even more of a vital role to support Kip and the ministers at Home Office who are doing an excellent job already. Thank you. Um, Kit, um, Jason's charges, yeah? So youth, youth funding uh, decrease, uh, violence reduction task force um, not happening. Um, 
And also, if you can get around to it, that issue about safeguarding, where do you draw the line? But yeah, so maybe Abby can do that bit. Yeah, absolutely. So on, on the, the uh, serious violence, I've answered this question so many times in the House of Commons. So we now have a thing called the Criminal Justice Task Force, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. So the fight against crime is elevated beyond just the Home Office. So he chairs that. Uh, broadly, it sets five, it set five key priorities. Murder, serious violence, drugs and county lines, and then what we call neighborhood crime. So burglary and robbery and some car crime. And he is personally driving that work. We meet on a regular basis with him chairing. I have to go and be shouted at or, or otherwise, uh, along with lots of other secretaries of state, because he wants to bind the whole government into the effort. Previously, it was really just a home office, possibly Ministry of Justice affair, but that has been subsumed into the... It is much better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's better because, as I said before, every department has to be a crime-fighting department. Every department has a part to play in getting crime down. And as I say, I hope in the, the beating crime plan, which we, thanks for referencing it, which we published in July, it points that out, right? But the PM says this again and again and again, that everybody has to play their part. On youth services, look, I understand there's a, there's a desire for kind of um, uh, consistency in these things, but we have to be flexible. You've got to remember that when, so for example, when uh, I became Deputy Mayor for Policing in London and Boris became Mayor, that was against a backdrop of very significantly rising youth crime in London. That was at the same time as Gordon Brown was spending money like water on things like youth services and police officers were all time high, all those kind of issues. So it's, it's not correlated. There is no causation necessarily between the two. Over the, the intervening four or five years, uh, you know, between 2008 and 2012, we went from 29 young people stabbed in London down to eight. That was at the same time that we were taking money out of the budget because of the, the requirement of austerity, right? So the two aren't necessarily connected. What we have seen, though, over the last couple of years, and this is why we have to be flexible, is a blip up in some of these crime types, particularly the advent of the county lines drugs model, which has really been a phenomenon of the last five or six years, um, where you know we've had to adapt what we do and look at the exploitation that's taking place and design our services according. So you know we have to flex, and one of the things I have learned in whatever... 12, 15 years now involved in crime, is it changes all the time, and so you have to be agile too, and that's what we're uh, trying to do. And then on the safeguarding versus criminality issue, this is often, frankly, quite a challenging area, uh, because you're right, often when they're very young, 12, 13, 14, obviously it is a safeguarding issue. Once you get into the later teen years, 16, 17, 18, sometimes very serious offenses occur, not least around violence, uh, particularly with drug dealing. So we have to make sure that the frontline services, police and associated support services are confident about their ability to deal with these issues, predicated on the overall mission, which is driving down crime and keeping everybody safe from, from violence. But in the end, as I say, it becomes a judgment call for those people at, at the front end. Now, we have been successful over the last few years in driving down the number of young people in the youth estate. Right, it's gone down from a very high, you know, we're down to a few hundred now, whereas it used to be in the thousands, right? And that is, is part of that notion of recognizing that there's a lot of safeguarding required, particularly at the young teenage years. Okay, we're going to go... Can I say something about glamour? Uh, you go on. So I have three children, and I feel in a constant battle with them, for, their, for them, for their soul, the way they think about the world with the, with the internet and what they see. Um, we've had to ban YouTube on occasions because of what is coming through, even in seemingly um, uh, innocuous videos around, you know, my son is obsessed with Minecraft, right? And so watches Minecraft videos on YouTube. But some of the stuff that appears on those videos, you have to, as a parent, police it really carefully. Uh, but what I hope, and this is why attachment is so important, is that I think we do need to think about target hardening young people, right? That if we can teach them at three, four, five, six, what a, a good life looks like, Right, that it's not about being a premiership footballer or a pop star or an Instagram influencer, right? That there is dignity and purpose and meaning in being a lawyer or an accountant or a local government officer or a probation officer or a police officer or a teacher or all those things, right? And, and instill a value system in them that I think we'll do as much as we can to, to fight it. And I think we need to think differently about some of the things we do. I think it was, there was a very famous industrialist in the state, States called Lee Iacocca, who used to run General Motors back in the 70s, and he said, in a rational world, the best of us would be teachers, and everybody else would fight for what's left. You know, these are the values that we need to teach our young people. Yeah. Um, so we've got literally about two minutes. 
Oh, no, 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 no. Um, he's, well, actually, he told me three minutes about five minutes ago, but he's gone away now. So we're going to do a really quick swoop round, and then we're going to come for fine, sorry, final comments on here. But please bear with us in terms of um, just as brief as you can. Oh, sorry, Mike. Hello. So county lines to, goes down to drugs, drugs use. You are never going to stop the demand for drugs. So is there any comments around moving the drugs market away from the criminals and the gangs to more of a public health issue where it can be better regulated and controlled? Okay. Um, not controversial at all, that one. Um, this gentleman here. Oh. Hello. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I, uh, I do like the uh, attachment argument. I'm 65. When I was 16, by the time I was 16, I knew dozens, probably several dozen adults outside authority and family. I had more Saturday jobs and opportunities than I could poke a stick at. I had bags of money because I earned it. If, 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 if I had any, pro any problems or I was going off the rails, there was some adult who was there, yeah. outside authority, who could put me right. And well, when I moaned, I was, not, I was badly done to. Somebody would always put me right. That opportunity is gone. My yeah. son, when he was 16, knew nobody outside authority, scouts, and family. Yeah, okay, great. Oh, me? <laughs> yeah. Um, similar question to the young lady earlier on. I take your point about 82% of heroin coming from Afghanistan or something like that. I don't know anyone that takes heroin, but I work in the city. I know a lot of people that take cocaine, MDMA, and other drugs like that. And I remember the first time I went to Fabric, and I was shocked at what was going on. And I just wonder, it looks like we've completely given up on policing drug use, and those young people are committing crimes as well. So do we go down the drug liberalisation route or do we get more serious on these young people, usually more privileged people, taking illicit drugs as well? Yeah, and this lady here, although there is this lady here too, so like Thank really you. I just half want to a pick sentence up, each. Yeah, I want to pick up on something Kit said about um, the complexities for parents at the moment. And I think whilst it is a common factor, we assume that... Um, children who get exploited are those from backgrounds with no support at our peril because actually that's not always the case. What can we do to better support parents in understanding what County Lines actually is and the dangers around it? Okay, and more than briefly. Hi, I'm Gina Ciceroni, the co-CEO of the Fair Education Alliance. My question is, we're in the youth zone. What do we need to work with young people and help them to be making the policies of the issues that you're addressing? Great, okay, I'm gonna start with Donna. You've got all of those. You don't need me to I'm gonna do this to in under two minutes if I can, because I'm conscious could. of time. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna go the way I've written down, crack cocaine versus cocaine. So the police are focused on the crack cocaine market because it's where you've got the exploitation. It's, the, it's, it's where the most harm is being created. However, the middle class cocaine use, not crack cocaine, the cocaine, you're absolutely on the money on that one. It is a huge issue. It doesn't come so much from Afghanistan it's coming much more from South America and other places like that and it's fascinating have a look Google drug map of the world and you'll see where it's all coming in and through um, so yes I totally get your point the 20,000 extra cops that's gonna help us I mean I'm, I know that the minister doesn't want to just stop at 20,000 the more police we have the more detection and pushing out campaigns say middle-class drug market you know what you're hurting people drugs public health completely agree with you really big issue if you're leading towards legalization, it's above my pay grade, the minister's here, I'm gonna let him say that one, but I totally get what you're saying. Drug safety rooms, drug testing rooms at festivals, things like that, I'm actually quite for that. It's, it's ignorant to say young people aren't going to do it. They are. Let's stop them from dying or getting really hurt. Um, final one, county lines. Um, what can we do to um, explain to parents what it is? I would be amazed if there are people in this room that didn't learn something by my explanation at the beginning explaining how terrorism links the county lines and sexual exploitation and paedophilia with images being made of children that they shouldn't be. 
because we do need to be explaining that to parents. And finally, young people and what we can be doing to help them. I can't remember what the question was, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop at that point. Okay, thank you very sorry. much, Samuel. I've done young people. As brief as we can. I'm going to be even briefer. Uh, on drugs policy, I think we need to have a, uh, we need to have a conversation about decriminalisation, particularly of cannabis. I think that uh, people get very triggered by that word because not everybody understands there is a difference between decriminalization and legalization and actually within decriminalization there's a whole plethora of options that could help to dissuade uh, a, a young person from going down a particular path. On young people's voices being heard I guess the only thing I'm going to say is that I think there is a session at 7.15 in this zone about that so come back if you're really interested in an answer to that question. Brilliant. Abby? Um, I'm definitely not going to touch any of the conversations about drugs policy, but what I am going to say is that, um, and it kind of connects all the other points about trusted adults and positive relationships and role models. Um, f for me, youth services are, are where that's at. You know, we would all like to put in the preventative work that supports young people from the ages of two, three, four, and five, but we also have a whole cohort of young people that need our help and support now, and education around the misuse of substances, education around digital harms that can support holistic families as well as young people come from those positive relationships that youth workers and skilled professionals can bring into that space. Brilliant, and finally, Kit, should we be confident that we're on the way? that we're fighting back as hard as they are fighting to get the kids? Oh, definitely, and we're winning. Uh, slowly but surely, we are uh, winning. Look, I often get the, the drug legalization argument, but there's a couple of practical questions, right? Where would Boots get their cocaine? <laughs> and, and also, what makes you think the criminal gangs would just give up and go away and just wouldn't compete, right? Certainly, if you look at someone like Canada, which has recently legalized marijuana, what they found is that actually the, 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 the sort of illegal sector is competing. Stronger product, cheaper, better distribution model, right? Is, and, and if your overall objective is to have fewer drugs, less drugs in society, not more, because they are degrading, they have impact on your mental health, lots of stuff we don't really know yet about cannabis uh, and its impacts certainly on adolescent minds, which is obviously what a big moment of brain growth and development. I think we need to take care with that, that argument. Um, just on the, the kind of wider question about young people getting involved in Canada, I've met lots and lots of, of parents, uh, too many sadly, of, of kids, mostly boys actually, who've been killed in, in the sort of drugs industry, young boys. And the one thing a lot of them say is they had no idea. No idea that the, the young person was living a double life. And I do think there is a job to be done. I mean, it's awful to think that we might have to help parents train them to, to look for these signs. Uh, but certainly, we know, we can see signs of vulnerability amongst young people. The problem is communicating that and, and standing shoulder to shoulder with parents in, in terms of getting... But what I hope is that the work we're doing on enforcement will mean there are fewer young people involved. I mean, just simple things like us gripping the rail network. It, it, one of those tragic things is that young people get used specifically uh, to traffic drugs on the rail network because, A, the police can't recruit them as informants because they're underage, and B, they get a rail card, so they're cheap. I mean, it's, it's so cynical and horrible, the, the trade. But if we grip the rail network, they can't use them uh, quite as much. There are simple things like that that we can drive the number down. But in the end, the long-term solution is that young target hardening at a young age, uh, which is where I think we need to go. Thank you. And thank you to um, the great panel we've got here today, but also to you for being part of this discussion. Um, we've only just really, uh, you know, started to have this discussion in this session today. But, you know, these are kids' lives which are experiencing some of the things that we would all hope we never, ever see in our lives. And, um, you know, we all want to do and all need to do everything we can um, to not only to protect them, but to help them to succeed. That's my lead into a shameless plug because come back at quarter to six and continue that discussion. We've got a Commission on Li Young Lives um, uh, event here with Victoria Atkins, the new prisons minister working alongside Kit. Uh, I think it's her first outing in this kind of area, so come along and see what she says then, and we look forward to talking to you then. Thank you very much.